Hello, my name is Allison Park, and today I'll be presenting the work of some summer research. Um, our research focus was evaluating autofocusing metrics for plankton holographic microscopic image reconstruction. And so maybe that's kind of a mouthful, but I'll walk us through what that really means and show the results of our work for the summer. And just so I'm not some weird stranger in a little corner of your screen, uh, my name is Allison Park. I am a third year electrical engineering and computer science student at UC Berkeley. And my collaborator and mentor, Thomas Zimmerman, could not be here to film the video um, because only one of us could film the video, but I will be presenting this work. So first things first, digital holographic microscopy. What does this exactly mean? Well, holographic microscopy is um, the process that allows us to collect 3D information about an object as opposed to a flat, normal 2D image. And the digital part of this just means that we capture it with a camera such that we can reconstruct the 3D object based off of this 2D um, image collected off a normal camera. But first things first, what can we do with this and why is digital holographic microscopy useful to us? Well, maybe we should talk about plankton. And I am not talking about this little villainous um, twerp from SpongeBob. I am talking about something much more exciting. These are tiny little plants and animals that drift around our oceans. They provide the majority of our planet's breathable oxygen, carbon sequestration, and larvae nutrition. And monitoring plankton in their natural environment means that we are monitoring the ocean's health. Plankton are very sensitive to environmental changes, making them great biosensors, which means they can indicate if something is seriously wrong in our marine ecosystems. So monitoring these plankton is super important. And that was why we wanted to create a microscope. And a side goal was to have this microscope serve as an educational tool because we felt that it would be easy enough to build and a great way for students to really get their hands on building a microscope and using that to image something super valuable to the state of our planet. The requirements for this microscope, microscope would be that it was low cost, easy to build, and the focusing would be automated ideally. So how do we achieve this? First, let's take a look at Dennis Gabor's holographic microscope. This was the original model, and specifically, we're gonna be looking at an inline model, which means the light comes from one side and travels straight through um, past the object to the center plane. And so this coherent light source labeled L here in the image is going to pass through a pinhole in Gabor's setup and then strike an object and the object will refract this coherent light source resulting in an interference pattern. And our sensor labeled S here will pick up the result of both the interference waves or the in interference patterns, as well as the original coherent lit waves. Our specific affordable model does essentially the same thing without a pinhole. We place the plankton on a glass disc such that they are sitting on top um, or above our image sensor. And we use a Raspberry Pi, which is very affordable. And overall, this microscope costs under $30 to build. And so this was simple enough to build that we had a lot of students build a ton of them um, to get some experience working with hardware. And so as you can see here, a is the um, chip, B is the hinge, C labels the rubber cap, which was used to block the ambient light, D is the Raspberry Pi, E is the Raspberry Pi image sensor, and we remove the um, glass covering or the lens to not interfere with the plankton resting atop it in G, our glass slide. And so this is some PVC cut with a circle and there is some glass underneath that such that the plankton may sit in that little well formed and F shows the laser. And so this on the left is the entire assembled thing with a quarter for reference. So we have that microscope, but how does it actually make the holograms? Or in other words, how do we go from that interference pattern we captured to these images? Well, we have an imagery construction algorithm, which essentially reverse engineers what the object looked like based off how it refracted the light. In other words, it looks at the interference pattern and goes, what kind of object would have made this kind of interference? And so we use the Fourier transform um, in order to do this. And this is an established algorithm. And the one thing about this is that the algorithm requires knowing the distance from the screen. Or in other words, in the XYZ um, sample space for the plankton to swim in, where the XY is parallel to the sensor and the Z value is its depth in the viewing field, 
we need to know that true Z value in order to get clear images. And so here in the center, we see an image that was manually correctly focused at its true Z. But if we tried to plug a lower Z value into our reconstruction algorithm, we might get something like on the left here, very blurly, very blurry, unintelligible and not super useful to us. On the other hand, if we overestimate the Z value, we could end up with something on the right, which is clearly also not a focused image. And so getting the true Z is a double whammy because it allows us to get a 3D image um, that is clear, like we saw in the middle back there, which we can use for classification and other analysis. And it also gives us the plankton's 3D swimming information. So as it's swimming around in this little well, if we track its Z value over time and we have the X, Y value from watching it move around the screen, then we can um, get its swimming patterns. And that is also important to understanding plankton health and behavior. So getting that true Z is super important, but it can be a lot of work. In the previous example, a human, and by a human, I mean me, um, was able to find the true Z. But there are 30 frames per second in this video that we're capturing from the microscope feed. And there are dozens of objects in one frame or dozens of objects visible in the viewing plane. And all of those objects might exist at different depths in the sample well, which means they all need to be focused individually. Basically, all of this sums up to a whole lot of work. And a human can't really do this on the scale needed to do mass research on the state of our plankton. And so enter the focus of this paper, autofocusing. Um, and yes, that pun was unintentional, but I left it in once I noticed because we're focusing on autofocus. Autofocusing in digital holographic microscopy has been studied. And the general workflow is that you apply a focus metric to an image over a range of Zs. Then you mark the Z value with the highest score as our predicted Z. And so the idea here being that this image on the left, which is at a Z too low, would not be marked with a very high score according to our focus metric. This clear one in the center should get a really high score according to our focus metric. And this one on the right should get a pretty low score again. And so we wanna see a peak at our true Z and all other Zs get a low focus score according to our focus metric. But how do we select the focus metric? Again, there's a lot of other research on this and most of them use things like the USAF test chart, which is basically, um, you can imagine a crosshair of two lines and they try to see if they can focus on those lines. But plankton are dense 3D objects with lower contrast than that USAF test chart and they have lower grayscale variants which makes them pretty difficult to capture and focus. Additionally, we're using this low cost microscope, which is important to our goals, but that results in lower quality images, to be honest. And so this is a challenge, but one that we wanted to see if we could overcome. And so our goals with the finding a focus method would be having accuracy, or in other words, the ability to correctly identify the true Z as determined by a human, computational efficiency, because we want it to be fast so we can use it on um, lots of video frames with a lot of objects, and it should be easy to understand such that students could implement it for educational purposes if they wanted to. And they should be able to do this in Python, which is an easy to understand and accessible language. So how do we generate our data set? Well, we had two types of subjects acquired, the first being plankton, which are the main focus, but we also captured microfibers collected from the home, um, a home laundry dryer lint filter, with the idea of here being that microfibers are a type of plastic that are actually a really common pollutant in our oceans. And so we thought it might be interesting to see how this microscope compares on both types of subjects. We took one milliliter samples and pipetted them into the microscope well, creating a column around three millimeters tall. And videos were captured um, using the Raspberry Pi operating system and exported to USB. The videos we captured look something like this. It's super interesting and you can see the little critters swimming around in there. Um, one interesting thing about plankton is that though they can't really swim against a strong current like in the ocean, when you put them in the still water, they'll move around pretty quickly. And so it was pretty interesting watching them. And from these videos, we went ahead and collected some still images to do the autofocusing on. And so there were two ways by which we captured these images from videos. First, we had a manual way, 
which involved a custom Python program that allowed us to play through the video like the previous one, zoom in on specific objects of interest, and then adjust the Z value to find out which one was correct according to us as a human. We also had an automated pipeline which detected objects in the frame, tracked them around, would crop and save images at the rate of three images per second. And a human did still have to determine the true Z for the automated images, but it um, automated the process of finding good objects and cropping in on them. Our image criteria was that there was one object in the bounding box. The specimen must belong to one of the designated classes and not be some strange contaminant or anything. And the specimen and their fringes must be fully in the image. And when we say fringes, we're just referring to those refracted light waves bouncing off of the object. It's worth noting that manual Z detection is still not necessarily simple. Even as humans, sometimes we look at plankton and it's hard for us to tell when it's at the true Z. If a human has trouble doing it, a computer is probably not going to have the easiest time either. And so we can imagine the cylinder is maybe something vaguely plankton-like. And there are multiple different planes where you could capture that and say, yeah, that's the true Z, the plankton is in focus. When in reality, there's a couple different options and it's not always easy to determine which one is the best. The other thing is that algae, which was one of our subclasses of plankton, are amorphous. And that means it's even harder than the other plankton types. For um, humans, it was really difficult to tell when the algae was in focus because they're this weird like blurry shape. And we took the focus as the point between emergence and disappearance of fine features but they were definitely not always easy to determine in the case of algae. In total, we collected 64 images of eight different classes to see if the focus metric performance had anything to do with the shape and size of the plankton we were working with. It's worth noting that all of these images here are shown on the same scale. We compared six focus methods, and it's worth noting first that they operated on different types of images collected from the holographic microscope. The holographic microscope collects both phase and amplitude image for the light captured by the sensor. And some of the focus metrics only operate on the amplitude image. Some operated using the phase information and some operated using the complex or both. And so variance is one of our metrics that operates on the amplitude image. It's a statistical measure of how much your data varies from the mean, or in other words, how much the darkness levels of the image were varying from the mean darkness of the whole image. Then we had the simple method called dark. And so this is just the darkness of the darkest pixel in the image. Then we had contrast. And so this is another very simple method. And this one just took the difference between the darkest and lightest pixels in the image. Then we have amplitude. And so this is the differences of the complex image between the current and most recent Z-step reconstructions summed. Then we have the phase mean. And so this means we took the unwrapped phase image, which is just the phase image with a little processing um, using the SciPy unwrapping kit. And then we took the mean darkness of that unwrapped phase image. And our last method we looked at was the phase variance, which is the variance as described earlier of the unwrapped phase image also as described earlier. And so these were the six methods we ultimately compared. There were other contenders in the race, but these were the ones that seemed the most promising. To evaluate the accuracy of these images, we had a few simple steps. First, we ran the method over a focus search range at 20 micrometer intervals, producing focus score values. We normalized the score value to range from zero to one. We determined the predicted Z to be where a peak occurred, or in other words, the minimum or maximum value, depending on what that specific metric was looking for. We said a method was successful if it was able to get the predicted Z within some tolerance of the true Z. Here are the results and analysis. First, we're going to look at the processing time. The contrast and the darkness were super fast and efficient, which comes unsurprisingly when you think about how simple those methods were. It was just taking the darkest pixel or even subtracting the darkest and the lightest pixel. We saw the variance and amplitude did similarly, um, still in a pretty fast range. And then we had the methods that worked on the unwrapped phase image. And 90% of the time for those images was spent unwrapping the phase image, which is that pre-processing I mentioned earlier, but that was a real time sink for them. And so those took much longer in comparison to the other four methods. Overall, we note that the reconstruction took 26 microseconds, which means that the phase variance and the phase mean methods are taking twice as long as just the time to reconstruct the image. So it adds a pretty significant overhead 
to the process. Next, we're going to look at accuracy by specimen class. And so here we see that we measure accuracy as the percent of images it was able to successfully classify. We're remembering that success is regarded as finding the predicted Z within some tolerance of the true Z. And we have one represented as light colors here and zero represented as dark colors here. And so we can see that if we have a tolerance of 100 micrometers, um, we get different performance versus if we raise that tolerance to 200 micrometers, noting that there is a total of three millimeters that the specimen can exist within because that was the size of our sample well. The rows represent the different biological plankton classes that we were looking at, and the columns represent the different focus methods with the rightmost column or the any column, considering an image successfully predicted if any of the six methods was successful. And this provided a collective indicator of class difficulty. And so we can see, for example, that the did class is overall really hard. And even if we had the foresight to look across all methods, we still wouldn't have gotten it right. And this is an interesting indicator of which classes of plankton are overall harder for us to focus. We also wanted to look at the error. And so these are some histograms showing the number of images um, corresponding to each error where we are centering around zero or in other words, the true Z. And so for example, the amplitude method um, seems to have a pretty sharp peak at the true Z or in other words, we're getting a lot of images with zero error. And there's some standard baseline with a slight skew towards underestimating the Z or getting errors in the negative. We saw with contrast that there's a peak in the middle but we also see strange peaks towards the um, high end. This led us to look at the focus search range, or in other words, the range of possible Z values we were considering when focusing these images. And we realized that a lot of our images were incorrectly predicting towards the ends of this focus range. And this leads us to consider that maybe we need to shorten this range in the future. We also wanted to look at trends in the focus score plots. And so, um, here on the left, we see what the ideal plot should look at. There is a clear peak around the true Z, or in other words, zero error centered at the middle, and every other value is clearly not the maximum. However, we noticed that there were four general trends in the focus score plots across all different focusing metrics. And so these trends were having multiple peaks without a lot of noise, as shown here, having multiple peaks with a lot of noise, and finally, a strange, almost more linear trend in the focus metric scores. And this leads us to some interesting discussion. The first interesting point is that focus metric performance is class dependent. And we can see these trends pretty clearly represented on this matrix right here. So for example, the amplitude method seems to perform best for the blepharisma and paramecium classes. For the um, dinoflagellate class, it seems like variant works pretty well, as well as the phase variance. And um, for the ciliate classes, we see that the darkness method works well, along with contrast and phase variance. And so these trends continue down. And it's worth noting that the didinium class and the algae class were difficult for all metrics. We could also consider combining methods for even greater performance. And so for example, combining the amplitude um, variance and dark methods would on average only add 12% overhead to the reconstruction time, but yield much better performance. And we could see that variance and darkness, for example, would make up for AMP's lacking performance in the cilia class. And so these combinations might be something valuable to look into because the phase methods took so long, they weren't really considered as, as valuable as combining amplitude variance and dark, for example. And so in conclusion, our goal was to find an automated focusing metric, but plankton are a pretty complex subject and we had to remain cost efficient and accessible. So this meant we had to be pretty crafty. And we looked at the focus metric performance across different classes to discover that it seems like focus metric performance varies based off which class you're looking at. And being a little more specific about which met metric you use might yield better performance, even when dealing with subpart image quality and combinations may yield even better results, but that is for future research. And so that is the conclusion of this presentation. Some acknowledgements, this material is based upon work supported by the National Science Foundation. 
Um, and we would like to thank the NSF for financial support, as well as Dr. Kadar Kerr from the Indian Institute of Technology, Delhi, for his advice on focusing methods and introducing us to the amplitude focus method. We would also like to thank Professor Raymond Esquera and Professor Mark Chan of San Francisco State University for co-teaching the classes that produced the microscopes and data sets used in this paper. And of course, the class students in that SFSU class whose holographic images were used in this paper. Thank you for attending this virtual talk. And if you have any questions, you can always contact me at this email. Have a good day.